Oh man, is there a lot to talk about with this one. Sorry I haven't been posting lately, guys. Let's just say I've been a little sick and I've also been kind of busy. I got some videos in the pipelines on some different subjects coming up at some point, I promise. Alright, so as I predicted, a Soonjian trailer was the next trailer to drop. And I've been looking forward to this one for a while, as both Soonjian and his eldest son, Soon Se, are two of my favorite individuals from the end of the Han Dynasty. We also got a good look at the campaign map that I want to touch on as well, and maybe some hinted gameplay things buried under the surface. But since I'm also kind of that Three Kingdoms guy, it's too bad Channel Awesome isn't really a thing anymore, that could have been my name on there. I want to talk about the historical Sunjian and his family because they are quite interesting. I'm drawing a lot of my information from Records of the Three Kingdoms, but also in this particular instance, Generals of the South by Rafay de Crispigny, who is the historical consultant for this game and the leading Western scholar on the Three Kingdoms period. I guess the best way to start is with a breakdown of what we see in the trailer and go from there. In 190 AD, after a disastrous defeat, Dong Zhuo realized he could not win against the coalition and he withdrew from Luoyang, burning it to the ground in the process. Dong Zhuo would flee to Chang'an, and while Cao Cao would pursue him, Sun Jian entered the ruins of Luoyang with his army to secure the city, or, you know, what was left of the city. Sun Jian was actually a minor warlord from the south of China during the end of the Han Dynasty, though he was also a highly successful one. He was a staunch imperial loyalist and fought on numerous campaigns on behalf of the Han court, mostly by helping put down rebellions, including the famous Yellow Turban Rebellion. It is claimed in some records that the Sun family is descended from Sun Tzu, the famous general of the spring and autumn period who wrote The Art of War. As with all claims like that in history, it is acceptable to be skeptical. Nonetheless, if it was indeed true, it certainly shows in who Sun Jian was as a person, as he was a very effective military commander, and this would also carry over into his eldest son, Sun Se, as well. When Sun Jian entered the ruins of Luyong, the situation was a total disaster. Most of the population was either dead or they fled, and Dong Zhuo pilfered all the imperial tombs on his way out. In the novel Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Sun Jian finds what is called the Imperial Seal in a well, which was a symbol of imperial power used in the Han court. According to the Book of Wu, which is one of the books that information was drawn from to create records of the Three Kingdoms, Sun Jian did actually find a Jade Seal amongst the ruins, but the whole business of it being in a well is straight from the novel. During the coalition, Sun Jian was by far the most active member in both history and the novel. And in history, you can make a strong argument that he was the only active member for the vast majority of it. Sun Jian scored a number of great victories, including besting Dong Zhuo's officers Hua Xiong and the infamous Lu Bu in pitched battle, two feats that are attributed to Guan Yu via single combat in the novel, the later also involving his sworn brothers Liu Bei and Zhang Fei. Sun Jian did not get along well with the coalition. Technically, he was a vassal of Yuan Shu, the half-brother of Yuan Shao, though many of the coalition members grew very jealous of him due to his victories and actively conspired against him. This included severe rationing of supplies and failure to support or reinforce him until Cao Cao eventually stepped up to the plate. These setbacks, due to greed, jealousy, and a lust for power, are what led to the coalition's collapse and also one of the primary reasons the coalition did not capture Dong Zhuo in the first place. Unfortunately, the success Sun Jian found would be his undoing. He would be killed after the dissolution of the coalition in battle against the warlord Liu Biao, whom he fought against on behalf of Yuan Shu. Sun Jian was ambushed and killed, with most agreeing that it was Liu Biao's general Huang Zhu and his men who did the deed. Sun Jian's heir was his eldest son, Sun Se, but Sun Jian had a total of eight children we know about, five sons and three daughters. The most famous ones are probably the ones you are already familiar with. The eldest son, Sun Se, 
also known as the Little Conqueror, his second son, Sun Quan, the first emperor of Eastern Wu, and his eldest daughter, Lady Sun, also known as Sun Ren or Sun Shangxiang. Almost all of Sun Jian's sons had lives that were cut short. Sun Se would be assassinated in 200 at 25. Sun Jian's third son, Sun Yi, was assassinated at the age of 19. And his fourth son, Sun Kuang, died in his early 20s as well, we don't really know why. Sun Jian's other son, who was not Sun Quan, Sun Long, was illegitimate and he never found much success and would eventually be banished from the Sun family by Sun Quan for a military failure. Next to nothing is known about Sun Jian's second and third daughters except for the fact that they existed and they married some Wu officials. If you're familiar with the Game of Thrones, just consider the Sun family like the Starks of ancient China. Talking now about Sun Jian's design, you'll notice a very strong tiger motif in almost everything he appears in, this game being no exception. This is because of his historical nickname. He was known as the Tiger of Jiandong. Like most historical nicknames, the origin of it is open to speculation. But his ferocity in battle, cunning and tactical mind, or simply the way he looked, are all possible interpretations. Another thing you may have noticed is Sun Jian is almost always depicted in red. This is because, well, he actually wore red. We actually have records that mention Sun Jian always wore a felt red scarf, which most likely refers to some kind of headdress, considering the Yellow Turban Rebellion is also known as the Yellow Scarves Rebellion. In fact, Sun Jian was so known for wearing red, he actually had to give his headdress to someone else to shake off pursuers during the campaign against Dong Zhuo. Now before I talk about Sun Jian's children, let's talk about the campaign map. First off, it's very stylized and vibrant, and I gotta say, I like it a lot. It looks very lush and varied. When we zoom out at the end, you can see both Taiwan and Korea, and it's likely the map zooms out even further than that. You know, it might be intentional we get our first look at the map with the trailer focused on what is pretty much Wu, as Eastern Wu had a lot of external contact with other areas of Asia during the Three Kingdoms period. A big reason of why that is, is because of Wu's location along the Yangtze River and also the East China Sea, which were major trade and travel routes. Wu had expeditions in both Vietnam and Taiwan, and also tried numerous times to secure an alliance with one of the Three Kingdoms of Korea. Eastern Wu had also been visited by many foreign dignitaries and merchants, at least one of which is attested to being from the Roman Empire. Whether that's true or not, I'm gonna be honest, we really don't know. One thing I noticed, which might just be for cinematic purposes, is the various models and animations we see on the map, which might indicate some gameplay features. For instance, Dong Zhuo fleeing the capital is followed by a large caravan. Later, when Sun Jian visits the coalition camp, we see an actual camp model. The later of which makes me wonder if we'll see a return of temporary structures like the forts or camps from the first Roman medieval too. Though that could just be the model characters will use when they are encamped. Dong Zhuo and his trail of caravans is especially interesting. Again, it could just be an artistic choice for the trailer, but there are a few instances in the history and novel where armies traveled with large caravans, so that might play a role in the game. A good example for later on if you know your Three Kingdoms is the Battle of Chongban in 207 when Liu Bei was fleeing from South Cao. A large portion of the peasantry in the lands he dwelt in fled alongside him forming a massive caravan of people. It makes me wonder if that will be a game mechanic of some kind. I also want to talk about the battle footage we see here mainly the role of cavalry. So cavalry was an integral part of the later Han Dynasty. The early Han saw the shift from chariots to cavalry, and the later Han started the perfection of cavalry as a fighting force. The Han adopted cavalry because of how much more effective they were against nomadic horsemen. And by the time of the Three Kingdoms period, cavalry was especially dominant on the battlefield. In fact, it wasn't too uncommon for some armies to consist of mostly cavalry, especially the elite and private armies of individual warlords. So that being said, we can probably expect to see a lot, and I do mean a lot, of cavalry in this game. Also, the use of wedge formation over there, it just looks so epic. I love it. I'm really looking forward to the battles in this game. 
One thing I'm surprised about though is there was no indication of naval combat in this trailer, which strikes me as weird because Wu was the most nautical of the three kingdoms, due to its position on the Yangtze in East China Sea. Though I expect we're saving the naval battles for a later reveal, I'm just surprised they weren't shown off with what is basically the naval faction trailer. Now I suppose the last thing to do is talk about Sun Jian's three major children who I'm fairly certain we do see in the trailer. So first up is Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu was Sun Jian's eldest son, and it is possible his first campaign was alongside his father during the coalition against Dong Zhuo, though it was probably later on during Sun Jian's battle against Liu Biao. Sun Tzu would succeed his father at the very young age of 16, where he would find shelter under Yuan Shu. Sun Tzu served Yuan Shu for a few years, conquering various locations for his lord, despite almost always being undersupplied and undermanned. Man, Yuan Shu just really does not like the Sun family, huh? Sun Tzu's successes would earn him the respect of his father's former generals. Eventually, Sun Tzu relinquished his service under Yuan Shu, with him trading the Imperial Seal for his freedom in the novel, and also according to the Book of Wu. So with his new supporters, which included veterans of his father like Huang Gai and Han Dong, as well as extended family and good friends of his like Zhou Yu, he would begin a rapid conquest of the ancestral lands of Wu, starting with the Sun family's place of origin, Jian Dong. In just a mere four years, Sun Tzu carved out a massive swath of territory that rivaled the already established Yuan Shao and Cao Cao. Because of this, he earned comparisons from his detractors to Xiang Yu, who overthrew the Qin dynasty, which is why he is sometimes called the Little Conqueror. Unfortunately, Sun Tzu's success would be short-lived. In 200 while in between campaigns and on a hunting trip, Sun Tzu was killed via political assassination. In the history, these men were loyalists to Xu Gong, who was a regional lord of Wu before Sun Tzu took power. However, the novel and folklore tell a slightly different story. Sun Tzu executed a Taoist healer named Gan Ji, who came back as a vengeful ghost, and cursed Sun Tzu to die young, and also that played a role in his death. Nevertheless, Sun Tzu's achievements would be instrumental to the founding of Eastern Wu. The records describe Sun Tzu as being handsome and lighthearted, though also bold and courageous. He was known for being generous and for promoting on merit. However, he was also a warrior first and a governor second. But he was aware of his shortcomings enough to promote more capable individuals to fulfill the areas he lacked in. His younger brother, Sun Quan, was in many respects the opposite. Sun Quan was a statesman first and hardly a warrior. He was much more shrewd than Sun Tzu. Sun Quan was humble from a young age and was also skilled in diplomacy and negotiating. He was much stricter than his brother too, though he held great respect for the officers who earned it. Sun Quan initially joined his brother on the final leg of his conquests. In 200, while on his deathbed, Sun Tzu appointed the still teenage Sun Quan as his successor. The young Sun Quan was very hesitant and inexperienced, and there were some senior officers who distrusted him at first. However, of the benefit to Sun Quan was that Sun Tzu was extremely close with a man named Zhou Yu, whom he personally entrusted Sun Quan to. Zhou Yu was highly respected among the Wu officers, and due to Zhou Yu's loyalty to Sun Tzu, he had no intention to betray Sun Quan. Also thanks to Zhou Yu's influence, Sun Quan found the aid of other talented minds like Zhang Zhao and Zhang Hong. He would spend the next seven years consolidating power, occasionally warring with Liu Biao, the Shan Yue tribesmen and rebels. In 208, Sun Quan's time to shine came. Cao Cao's massive army was heading south to secure the lands of Wu, and Sun Quan was visited by a fleeing Liu Bei with a meager force. Sun Quan had pretty much two options. He could surrender to Cao Cao and sacrifice everything his father and brother achieved, or he could stand against Cao Cao with Liu Bei. The future of Wu was decided on the waters of the Yangzhou River that winter, during the Battle of Chur Bi, or the Battle of Red Cliff, where the forces of Wu and Liu Bei fought Cao Cao. 
and use a combination of ingenious subterfuge, clever ploys, and tactical genius to sink Cao Cao's massive fleet. Oh, and in the novel, there's a little bit of magic, too. Sun Quan's problems did not end there. They would only grow. He lent Liu Bei the lands of Jing province temporarily, which Liu Bei refused to give back. Cao Cao, now his enemy, was constantly threatening his lands from across the river. Eventually, Sun Quan killed two birds with one stone, when he conspired to take his lands in Jing back and allied with Cao Cao in 219 at the Battle of Fawn Castle. This battle saw the death of Liu Bei's sworn brother, Guan Yu, and would forever damage the Sun Liu alliance. Sun Quan was among the last of the three rulers Sao Pi, Liu Bei, and himself to declare himself emperor. He did it in 229, and he ruled until 252, where he died at the age of 71. Sun Quan's rule experienced an abundance of problems as he grew older, including becoming an alcoholic, practicing favoritism, and also being corrupt. Unfortunately, the same man who had set in stone the rise of Wu would also set in stone the downfall of Wu. The last to talk about is Lady Sun, the eldest daughter of Sun Jian. In the novel, she's known as Sun Ren. In folk stories and also Dynasty Warriors, she is known as Sun Shangxiang. Lady Sun was very young when her father died and she probably barely knew him, as he spent most of her life on campaign. In most forms of fiction, Lady Sun is depicted as a warrior of some sort. While that's very unlikely, she would never be any type of general, there is a moderate degree of truth behind that depiction. Records state that Lady Sun was not exactly your typical princess. She had an interest in horse riding and the martial arts, especially archery. She was fond of wearing armor, and her guard of 100 plus women also wore armor and carried swords. Again, this was not exactly the norm when it came to women in ancient China, so it's not surprising something like that would be recorded. Now, Chinese folklore has a long tradition of women warriors. One needs to look no further than the story of Hua Mulan to see this is true. Women warriors in history, though, have always been the subject of much debate. Did they exist? Most likely here or there, depending on the culture. Did they exist in great numbers? Well, that's very unlikely. That's the simple answer, in my opinion. As for the historical Lady Sun, she was married off to Liu Bei after the Battle of Cherbi to strengthen the Sun Liu alliance. It was 100% a political marriage, and the records state that Liu Bei was rather distrustful of Lady Sun, and also somewhat was afraid of her, for her not-so-traditional interests in military affairs. Eventually, Lady Sun would return to Wu a few years after her marriage, and years after that, the alliance would break anyway. And she would vanish from the records after that. She was also likely a teenager when she married Liu Bei, who was approaching his 50s, but that's the ancient world for you. She also bore him no children. Now, I can already tell the inclusion of Lady Soon as a general is going to draw the ire of the historical purist crowd, but I'm willing to bet all the money in the world that she's going to be exclusive to the Romance of the Three Kingdoms mode, which I think makes the most sense. So, there you have it. I know this was a long one, but there's so much I didn't even get to cover. When the game comes out, as you can imagine, I'm going to do a Let's Play, I decided of at least one faction on my channel. I want to see who all of them are before I decide, but I will say I do have a soft spot for both the Soon Clan and Cao Cao. Although I guess that last one shouldn't be a surprise since I voice him in Dynasty Warriors 8 of Ridge. Anyway, as it gets closer to release, I'll be sure to keep all of you updated with my potential plans. And we still got about like nine more faction trailers left to go, so I'm excited to see if my predictions are right. If you liked this video and you found it informative, do all that stuff people ask you to do at the end of every YouTube video. You know what I mean.